Hey family, Pastor Artie here with your men and coffee this morning. Do you know how to rejoice in all situations? I mean, all situations, good and bad. You know, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter four, starting at verse 10, let's read it. It says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. And now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regards to need for, I have learned that in whatever state I am to be content. Then he talks about, you know, in both abounding and in famine, and you know, then he finishes off with that statement in uh, verse 13 where he says, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So how, can you rejoice in those situations? Are you thankful for whatever the day holds for you? Do you sit there and look at opportunity when it presents itself? Are you excited about what God is doing in your life? You know, sometimes there's things that happen in our lives that God didn't mean for it to happen, but it does. But how do you react to it? Do you sit there and get all angry and mad and just can't stand life? Or do you sit there and say, you know what, praise the Lord. You know, having been retired for quite a while now, you know, I started out on disability and I just recently retired from Northrop. You know, I've learned one thing, that I need to learn how to be content. You know, I see so many of my friends who are not content. They struggle, they strain in life. You know, they either drink too much or smoke too much or they get addicted to things, you know, uh, drugs and what have you. And they turn out to be a mess and a lot of them have already died. And I'm like, wait a minute, at 62, you're already dead. A lot of them died before that. And I think about it, it's like because they don't have the joy of the Lord in them. They don't know how to rejoice in any situation that they're in. You know, Paul gives us great examples in the Grace Gospels. And I think that's why God gave us Paul as the apostles to the Gentiles, because he wanted us to learn that his grace is sufficient. The Old Testament taught the law. And there was no way anybody was going to fulfill that law. 600 plus laws that they had to maintain. And it says if you sin in one, you sin in them all. What a horrible place to be in. I'm so glad I don't have to live under the Old Testament and the restrictions that God put on his children, the children of Israel. But he called me as a Gentile into a new light. He's made me a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new today. And in that, I can rejoice in every situation that I'm in, good or bad. Whether I'm sick and having to go through surgery or whether I'm well and ready to go run a mile. Well, I can't run a mile, but I can walk three miles or four miles. You know, it's whatever situation I'm in, I can rejoice. Whether it's hot or whether it's cold outside, I can rejoice. Whether I have money or I don't have money, I can rejoice. How are you handling life today, family? Are you rejoicing or are you cursing God? Are you turning your back on him? You know, it's often said that anybody can say that they're something, but until they're that, they're not. You know, I see so many people out there, some of them claiming to be pastors. You know, and they never went to school. They don't have an ounce of education when it comes to this word. You know, a lot of them have been appointed by their senior pastors and made them pastors, but that's not what makes a pastor. You know what makes a pastor? What happened to me back in, 19, in the 1970s, I was at a church and I walked out. I was striking a set from one of our Easter plays and I got it all put away and I'm walking across the parking lot and my senior pastor had seen me carrying the cross off the stage and he goes, that cross needs to be out on those streets. I said, you know what, pastor, you're absolutely right. All you gotta do is find someone to take it. And I put the cross away and I walked out of the church after I locked it up and I'm walking across the parking lot and I heard a voice that said, well, why can't you? And I thought, and I thought to myself, wait a minute, God, I can't do that. 
And I came up with all these excuses. Number one, I'm not a gangbanger. You know, I lived in Wilmington. I didn't run with the, with the vatos. I had no clue what those cats were about. You know, I always seen them from the LAPD side where they were shooting each other and killing each other over territory in a block. You know, which was, to me, it just made no sense at all. It was crazy. But he told me, why not you? And God, at that point, put a call on my life because the very two weeks later, they had a board meeting at the church and the senior pastor called me into his office and said, you know what, we prayed and we know that God put a call, a call, get that, C-A-L-L, -L, a call upon your life to minister the gospel to the lost. And you don't believe it. I said, well, you know what, Pastor Don, I don't. And he said, you know what, we're going to pay and send you through seminary. We're going to pay for your education because you need to be well equipped in the word, with the word, carrying this sword out on those streets and sharing the gospel with others. So they sent me to college. I graduated. I got ordained. You know, I've done something that a lot of pastors have not done. You know, I actually went to school and I got my education. I even got a diploma. I got my degree. Not that it means anything. You know, I often told my professors, oh, here's another piece of paper to stick in a box. You know, and that's what it was because my call was assured. I was assured by God. So I'm satisfied in every situation I'm in. Even when he called me into that, when he called me into ministry. I had a great job at Northrop. You know, I was an explosive technician. I didn't have to quit my job. So I didn't, and I became a vocational pastor. I did all the work in the evening, and I worked during the day so that I would not become a burden upon the church. And God gave me satisfaction in the good and the bad. Today, family, can you rejoice in what God is doing in your life? Can you? I hope you can. Philippians 4 tells us all right there, starting in verse 10 to 13. Number one, you should be rejoicing in every situation that you're in. To be content, Paul says, I'm content. What is contentment? You know, when you've eaten a big meal and you're sitting there and your belly's full, you're content that you had a good meal. That's the way God's talking to us. Be content with what he's given you today. In every situation, whether you go through bad times or good times, whether you lost loved ones or you gained friends, be content because God has done it for you so that you can give him praise. Today, family, praise the Lord a little bit. Be content in everything that you go through today because Jesus loves you with a never-ending love. And God wants you to just rejoice and praise him for the walk that he's taking, to, taking you through. You can't control it. You have no control over your day. You know that you can go to work and stuff, but you have no control over what happens, the circumstances. So today, family, trust God. Walk in his ways. Allow him to show you the good and the bad of this world. And then give him praise and rejoice. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace today. And may he bring contentment into your life as you learn to follow him. Linda and I love you. The rest of the staff here at Rock, Pastor Tony and myself, we're lifting you guys up every day in prayer that you will learn how to praise the Lord in good times and bad. And therefore, like Paul said, I find it that I am content. May you be content today. We love you and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.